The reading today is from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 25 through 33. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, to put one's mouth to the dust, to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. The word of the Lord. Rami M. Shapiro writes, The stories we tell about ourselves determine the quality of the selves we imagine we are. The stories we tell about others determine the quality of our relationship with them. It is so good to be back with you. I remember being here about a year ago. I remember the choir and a lot of your faces look very familiar. It is a joy to be here. You know I'm a storyteller. (laughs) Now I was told that your having a theme this year on the Lord's Prayer, and I was told to say something about forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And as soon as I got that email, I'm sorry, you've got to listen to another story. In February of 1975, at the age of 22, I moved back from Dalton, Georgia after spending an incredible nine months living in a Christian community called the Ark on two houseboats in the harbor of Amsterdam, the Netherlands. The Ark was one of several communities known as the Dilaram Ministry. Dilaram is a Farsi word meaning peaceful heart. The Dilaram communities were known as houses of the peaceful hearts. I returned to my hometown because I needed to attend to a health issue and complete a couple of courses so I could graduate from college. I needed a job. And so I secured one working in an office, at one of the carpet mills in Dalton, Georgia. And many of you or some of you may know that Dalton touts itself as the capital carpet of the world. By the summer, I was going stir crazy. I felt trapped in the office. It was too confining. So I found another job with the Dalton, Georgia Water, Light, and Sewer Company. Now, having no skills, I was assigned to a crew that mainly did the scuzzy work that no one else wanted to do. The crew consisted of me, the fresh college student with no job skills, J.C., an illiterate man who was used to hard work, and Henry, a poorly educated man who really didn't want to work. Now, J.C. and Henry were both lifers. They had been at the job a long time, and they were putting in time until retirement. But my story's not about them. It's about Curly Patterson. Curly was a good old boy from the South. You do know I'm from the South, right? You've made that connection. And he happened to be efficient at repairing gas mains. He had his own company truck. He usually worked alone. But on occasion, when he needed help, I would be taken off my regular crew and assigned to him. Now, I I, I need to be kind in saying this, but I grew up in a 
faith tradition that saw the world in black and white. There was little room for gray areas in my tradition. Some people were in and some people were out. The tradition was efficient at determining who was held in God's grace and who was doomed. Now, Curly Patterson, based on my early cultural religious training, personified a sinner. Every other word that came out of his mouth was a curse word. I'd never heard anything like it, Ray, until I started playing golf. <laughs> he dipped snuff, and for so long that his teeth were rotten, and there were always seemed to be a dribble of dark liquid coming out of the side of his mouth. And he also drank. In the glove compartment of his truck, he had a bottle of vodka, whiskey, sour mass, something to ease the pain of living. And on more than one occasion, I watched him take a satisfying wee dram from that elixir. Yep, Curly was one of the cursed, one of the wicked, one on whom God pronounced woes. We used to play horseshoes before work and at lunch. And somehow, in that exchange and watching Curly play horseshoes, he found out I liked fresh vegetables and pickled beets. And one day after work, he invited me out to his house to see his garden and to give me some vegetables and pickled beets. And as soon as we drove into the driveway, his wife came out of the house and they started at it. I had never heard such fussing and cussing in my life. It was just another mark on Curly's ledger as far as I was concerned. If there was anyone who ever needed saving, it was Curly Patterson. I worked for the Dalton Water Light and Sewer Department for about a year. And to this day, I still consider it one of the greatest learning experiences of my life. Heck, I learned how to use a shovel. In the summer of 1976, I returned to Amsterdam for leadership training. I had wanted me and my team to be sent to Kathmandu, Nepal, or New Delhi, India, or Kabul, Afghanistan, the location of the first Dilaram house. We were hippies, Jesus people ministering to Western travelers in search of enlightenment. Do you know where they sent me and my team? To Hamilton, New Jersey. <laughs> Nothing against New Jersey, but it's not Kabul, Afghanistan. They wanted to know if the Dilaram ministry and our idea of community would work in America. I was in New Jersey for about a year, a very eventful year. The people who lived at Hope House were grappling with all kinds of painful life experiences. Confusion over sexual orientation, domestic abuse, mental illness, the challenges of single parenting. I gotta tell you, I was way in over my head. And during that year, I asked my childhood sweetheart to marry me. She said no. <laughs> I was crushed. And in August of 1977, I fell deathly ill. And after two major abdominal surgeries and 62 days in the hospital, I returned to Dalton to recuperate. I'd lost 20 to 30 pounds, and my doctor at the time told me I had the blood chemistry of an old person. He advised me to rest, eat ice cream every day, and drink a beer. <laughs> now, this doctor obviously was not from the cultural religious background that I came from. 
I was lying on the sofa in the living room one day after being back a couple of weeks, and I heard a truck drive up in the driveway. I heard a door open and someone walking across the carport. My dad walked out of the garage to meet the visitor. And looking back, I assume they greeted each other and exchanged probably a brief conversation. I was overhearing it. But I only remember one sentence. One sentence. I heard the boy has had a rough time. I came by to see how he was doing and bring him some fresh vegetables and pickled beets. Yes, it was Curly Patterson. Now I'm sure somebody, friends and relatives, maybe even somebody from the church came to visit me while I regained my strength. I know the girl who broke my heart didn't come. But I only remember one person. He was a sinner. The roughest man I had ever met. I do not have words for what happened in that moment other than the cliche. I would never ever again judge a book by its cover. I've spent my whole life cultivating a heart and attitude that I pray and hope emulates the heart of God. Curly Patterson unknowingly helped shape my core theology, my understanding of grace, and the belief that there is a spark of the divine in all people, no matter how wounded. All people are the beloved of God, And that is what saves us, not a saving or newborn transaction that allows us to view humanity as some are in and some are out. Within my worldview, as one writer put it, we are saved not by being privately perfect, but by being part of the body. And I cannot remember who said this, but the writer says it this way. Grace in the person of Jesus Christ emerges incarnationally. God sits high, but looks low. Now, I don't want you to be confused by that sentence. I'm not thinking of Curly as the one who sits low. It could just as well be the young man who was trained to judge harshly. Curly Patterson did not need my forgiveness. I needed to forgive myself. Frederick Putner says it beautifully. We should remember in our prayers the foolish ones, the shy ones, and the overbearing ones, the broken ones, and the whole ones the despots and tosspots and crackpots of our lives who in one way or another have been our particular fathers and mothers and saints. As I told you last year, about six years ago before I retired, I attended a workshop on storytelling. I took away from the training three things. Do you remember them? A good story has to be yours. It has to be true. And it's told to connect the listener to their own story. I sincerely hope my story has connected you with your journey. Maybe there is a curly in your life. Let us take a moment of silence. And in that silence, I invite you to scan your life and to remember the curly in your life. Call the name aloud if you wish. These are the people who shaped our understanding of God's grace and love and in doing so, helped make us who we are today. 
Today we remember and we give thanks. Let us be in silence. A different kind of call to the offering. You ready for it? I'm seeing if I have the courage. Never think evil thoughts of anyone. It's just as wrong to think as to say. For a word that is unspoken. In God's eyes he sees it this way. In God's eyes, can't find the tune, we're like sheep in a meadow. Now and then a lamb goes astray, but open arms should await its returning. In God's eyes, he sees it this way. The ushers will receive. 